Saskatchewan undergraduate research journal. We call ourselves USURGE for short because obviously the full title is a bit of a mouthful. So my name is Jordan Welsh. I'm the undergraduate editor in chief for the journal. I'm a undergraduate student here at the university. And this is Brennan. Do you want to introduce yourself, Brennan? Sure. I'm Brennan, as Jordan said. <laughs> I'm also an undergraduate student at the University of Saskatchewan, and I'm the senior editor to the social sciences right now. I'm doing an honors degree in psychology. That's all I'll say because I run us over time every time. <laughs> Okay, so I'll give us a quick outline of what Brennan and I are going to chat about today. Uh, the first point we'll hit is why it's important to publish and what the benefits of publishing are in general. And then we'll talk about what usage is and what the publication process with us looks like. And then we'll have some time for questions to, to end us off today. So what are some of the general benefits to publishing? Um, it's to get your work outside of the walls of the classroom. So to share important findings, contribute to your research field, and allow others to build on your research findings. It also looks amazing on your resume, your CV, or grad school applications. So especially if you're wanting to pursue further study after your undergraduate degree, or if you're looking to pursue a career in academics, um, it's important to publish early, publish often, and then it'll also give you more opportunities for funding and scholarships. So what is USURGE? We are an online open access scholarly journal indexed in the DOAJ. So open access and DOAJ I'll cover in more detail in the upcoming slides here. We are a multidisciplinary journal, so we accept um, submissions from the humanities and fine arts, the social sciences, the natural sciences, and the health sciences, and any paper that kind of crosses the boundary between uh, any of those sections that I just mentioned. So we're, we are a peer-reviewed journal, so that means we follow a double-blind peer-review process. That's the uh, peer-review style that we adhere to. Um, so this slide just outlines sort of the reason that we have developed a journal model um, with USURGE that is free for authors to submit work and publish with us, um, and then also free for readers to access our publications. So here we have kind of how much a journal subscription to some of the big names like Wiley costs. So ScienceDirect for our libraries to have a subscription to their uh, journal database, it costs about 1.5 million a year. And for Wiley, it costs around 900,000 a year. So commercial publishers obviously make a lot of money. Elsevier is one of the largest publishers and they have a profit margin that's higher than Google, Amazon, and Apple. So some of those big tech com companies. So the issue is while these companies are making a ton of money, the authors and the reviewers still aren't being paid for their contributions to the journals. Um, and sometimes authors even have to pay to publish. So with Elsevier, for instance, if you're wanting to publish open access so that your work is available for free for readers, um, the fees for authors to publish open access range from around 150 to 5,000 US dollars. So open access is important, especially an open access model that does not, uh, does not ask for fees from authors. So why is open access important? It helps to accelerate research and knowledge creation. It democratizes access to research results. Um, it helps people make informed decisions. So if you're able to access information more readily, you're able to become a more informed consumer, a more informed person in general. And what does that mean for you? Well, if you, if you publish open access, it enhances your Googleability. And yes, Googleability is a word. Um, it also increases the visibility of your work. And that is because uh, anyone's able to access the publication if it's published open access. Um, and open access articles are generally cited more often. So I had mentioned that we are indexed in the DOAJ. So the DOAJ stands for the Directory of Open Access Journals. 
Um, it's a community curated online directory that indexes and provides access to high quality, open access, peer reviewed journals. So all DOAJ services are free of charge, including being indexed. So we are indexed within them for free. And all data is freely available. So in order to be indexed in the DOAJ, we have to follow a set of quality control guidelines that they provide. So that gives our journal a little bit of that quality assurance. So who can submit their work to us? Um, we welcome um, undergrad. We welcome work from undergraduate students from all colleges at the University of Saskatchewan for up to two years after you've graduated. And what do we publish? We publish high quality original work, and multi-authored work is also accepted. So the um, kind of forms that this high quality original work can take include peer reviewed formats, which are your kind of typical research article and review articles. Um, and then we also have a couple of formats that are not peer reviewed. So those include research snapshots, um, alternative submissions, which is a category that we're currently working on. So you'll see that pop up on our website in the next uh, year or so, um, as well as artwork. So these forms are not peer reviewed. Instead, what we ask is that students submit a paragraph of endorsement from their supervising professor, and that will be published alongside the research snapshot and an artwork. Um, and that will give these formats a little bit more of that quality assurance in the absence of peer review. So what is a research snapshot? So like I mentioned, it's not peer reviewed. They're generally a very short overview from uh, maybe a bigger body of research or a mini analysis. So they're usually around 500 words. It's a short, succinct description of your research goals, maybe your experience with the research process. Uh, usually you would include uh, a very brief outline of the methodology you used and the results if you have any yet. Um, as well as the significance of your work. So here's an example of what a research snapshot looks like. So as you can see, they're usually about a page in length, very short, very succinct. And then at the bottom there, I think it, we have the uh, yeah, statement of an endorsement from Dee Dee Dawson, who is a university librarian. So. So publication frequency, we publish continuously. And then there's two issues a year. So we just group all of the publications that fall within a certain timeline into one of those two um, submission or issues that we, that we publish uh, per year. So why should you publish with us? What are the benefits of doing so? Like I've mentioned a couple times, there's no publication fees, no fees uh, associated with submitting work. Um, we are open access. It's a great way to gain experience and hands-on experience in, in the process of peer-reviewed publishing. It's a great opportunity to get valuable and detailed feedback on your writing. So the reason that's bolded and underlined is um, we really focus on giving students lots of hands-on guidance throughout the publication process and lots of detailed feedback on the work. Um, so the feedback will be from the peer reviewer as well as the editors that are working on your submission. It's a great way to learn transferable skills in writing for publication, responding to feedback, and ev evaluating both the quality and the impact of your work. It's a great way to prepare for graduate studies or research courses. Um, and then you can also be considered for one of two annual best paper prize awards, which are $200 a piece. So what's the impact of our journal? 14 of our articles have been cited 56 times in peer reviewed journals. Um, and here's some quotes from our authors on the benefits of publishing with us. Uh, the first one, I appreciated all the comments that the reviewer left. I learned a lot from the editor too, and I think the paper has benefited considerably in its readability and usefulness. 
Um, I won't read the rest of those quotes for you because I'll send Brooke uh, this deck of slides and then she can send them out to you guys after so you can revisit them if you have uh, any questions. And the publication process. So this section here, Brendan will be covering with you guys. Are you gonna click through slides for me, Jordan? Yes, I sure will. Awesome, okay. So what I will be doing folks is like the literal, the gears there are apropos because I will be talking about how do you actually get something published from research and process there is kind of the key there because it is a process. Sometimes we've had students submit things and they think I doubt I got a really good mark on this in my class. It's good to go. We've never had a paper submitted that was just like great, perfect, publish it. So this is just going into sort of how the process works from when you are about to submit to the time it gets published. I'll do this when slide change. So okay. that is the that is the outline of the steps. And there is between step one and two, there is work for you to do. Step one has work and step two when it comes back there's work i will talk all about that as we go but basically a basic form of a standard typical non-alternative submission non-research snapshot goes submit your work peer review copy edit production publication production takes very very little work from you a lot of work from our amazing layout people yeah. the next there we go okay cool so uh Submitting your work. This is something that I would say at least 50% of students get tripped up on and it's not the biggest deal, but it does just create more work if you make a mistake on one of these things. And when I say it's not a big deal, I mean, you'll get a very kind email from an editor saying, hey, you forgot this thing, not anything bad will happen. But basically, there is a submission file, which is the, the paper you are submitting. When we say anonymized, depending on your word processor, it's a kind of complicated thing, but you can look it up. It's easy to do. But basically what we want, because we're sending this to peer review where the peer reviewer or reviewers shouldn't know who you are, we don't want your name on it. We don't want anything that can like personally identify that like, this is Jordan's paper. This is Brennan's paper. I remember this person. This is Shay's paper. This is Holden's paper. We don't want that there when it goes to peer review because you might have a relationship. It might be good or bad. We don't want it to affect the review process. Just there's that. And then they having permission to use any third party figures, basically that means don't submit something with figures or pictures or artwork that you don't have permission to use because we can't publish it that way. And we've had some papers that were really, really good papers and were really, really good original work that were based in part on already published stuff that they didn't have permission for and it takes longer to get that permission. So there's that. Now the public create publication agreement is really important because we cannot publish it without the publication agreement and that is you suggesting reviewers, you agreeing to have it published and also the copyright stuff. And there are other slides on copyright that we're gonna go into, but just make sure when you're reading the publication agreement, it's like seven pages long, but read every page because every page has something specific about what your work when it's done will look like when it's out in the world. And sort of the permissions that it has for people to look at it, for people to take it, for people to do stuff with it. So that's just follow the publication agreement when you download it. Make sure you've tried as best you can to anonymize it and have it in the state you want it when you send it to us. And this is the standard license that we use. You've probably seen this on any open access thing you've looked at. You may have seen it just out in the wild. Uh, the Creative Commons licensing are the licenses we use. It, and I have to give a shout out to a particular author who I won't name, but they really helped spur our like examination of this. What this means is you, if you send us your paper and say, I want this all rights restricted, or I don't want anyone to be able to take my work and do anything with it, Usurge isn't by dint of being an open access publication, it's not able to support that. We are designed to disseminate knowledge. Now that doesn't mean someone can just take your work and do whatever they want with it. That's what that CC by NC means. It means someone can take the work that's been published in Usurge, use it elsewhere, but they have to give you credit and they can't make money off of it. And there's also something down there called share alike. There are other licenses that we can, I believe, get access to that are under Creative Commons. Sort of just remix that formula a bit where someone can take your work and change it a bit. Someone can take your work and change it a lot, but they always have to give you credit. There are some commercial licenses under uh, Creative Commons, but they're like very rare. And there is a very, very restrictive Creative Commons license that's basically says, 
all a person can do with your work is take it and put it somewhere else. They can't make money off of it. They can't change it anyway, and they have to give you credit for it no matter what. So that's just a very brief, I promise it was a very brief outline of how Creative Commons work, but that's just how your work under usage will be licensed and protected, and you will always be given credit for your work. This is more of that navigating copyright. It's really one, I guess, theme of usage as a student run publication as open access. It's important for us that the people who are publishing with us being you, the authors, know that you have rights and know that like we are there to support your rights as authors. So this is more explanation of that and that it is automatically linked to it. And Harvest is sort of an example of an open access they, they call themselves free range publishing. It's about scholars supporting scholars. And really, it's important to keep in mind that as you're trying to publish with users, as you're working through this process, you're a scholar. So what you're producing is a scholarly work that needs to be protected, needs to be respected. And navigating copyright and sort of understanding those rights are important. So like, I'm not trying to make your day even more exciting. But if you have a chance to go look at Creative Commons and read through some other stuff, it is helpful just to understand like what could someone potentially do with my work, how would I like to protect my work? Because your work is important. And I just, I didn't even put this picture in here. Jordan sent me the slide and it's some pairs. It's pair review. It's peer review. This is that process where we take, and if you can't read it, if your screen's very small, it's one pair saying to another pair, this manuscript is horrendous. That's the voice that pair clearly has. Uh, what peer review is, is we take your work that you've sent to us after it has gone through a process internally of some minor revisions. So if you send us work and there's some issues that need to be resolved before we send it to a peer review, that's what we are going to do. So we're gonna say like, if this is, needs some clarity, if this needs citation work before it gets to a, a professor, and that's typically 99% of the times we send it to someone who's an expert in the field. The first step for us is internally within the University of Saskatchewan. Steps after that, if we need to, I have personally contacted respected scholars from universities in China, from people at the U of A, all of those. So like, what you need to know is your work will be treated with the respect that it's due. We will find an expert in the field to review your work so that the feedback you get is applicable to your work to make it stronger. There are some criteria there that the uh, author is eligible to submit. What that means is you are an undergrad student or you graduated in the last two years and that the work was produced by your undergrad student. So if you say are just entering an MA program and you write something in a class that's a good work, it, we can't publish that because you were doing it while you were a grad student. But as long as you produced it while you're an undergrad student, it's good to go. As long as it's through that two-year time frame, it's good to go. Uh, it's original, it's well-written, and we do work with you to improve writing for needs work. There's very rarely a time, I don't know that even all the time I've been with you, Serge, we've ever taken a paper and said, nope, we're just not like, sorry, good luck. We will work with you if there are certain writing issues, we will help you like get in contact with the writing center and they have amazing people there to, to work to make your submission stronger so that it does get to that peer review stage. And if it's plagiarized, then we immediately <laughs> send it back to you and say, this is, there's either a really big citation problem or it's not an original work, you need to do something with it. And obviously, we, I don't think we've ever gotten a submission that's like rudimentary, but that would be a thing if you're sending us a paper on Foucault and you say, did you know Michel Foucault was French? Okay, well, we're not going to publish a paper that's just like Michel Foucault is French. There's that sort of thing. It has all the guidelines sort of checked off, and that's that we will check with you to make sure they get there. And the anonymity of the work and the review process has not been compromised. That's that one, the publication agreement where you make sure like, to do that and anonymize stuff. It's also the part where we need to know that you haven't contacted Professor Y and said, I'm going to be submitting something to usage, keep your head up. It's probably coming your way. It needs to be anonymous. That's the basic thing. You need to not know who's reviewing it. The reviewer needs to not know who you are. So. And there you have a lovely quote. It is, it is critical. All of our authors have always, we've never received peer review uh, input that was like not helpful for the author. It's always improving. Everything you will get, I guess, Jordan has always said this to me and it's said it to others and I, it's fully true. The worst thing that could ever happen to you by submitting to usage is that you get a way better paper at the end. That's the worst thing that will ever happen if you submit to usage. Well, why peer review? So these people are the experts. They will tell you 
precisely in a field that you will understand probably sometimes better than the specific editor on your paper. What is the strength of your paper? What kind of needs to be like bolstered? Have other people touched on this? And if they have, how could your work improve upon it or sort of jazz with it? There's that thing. The feedback we've always we've always received amazing feedback from our peer reviewers. They're always very invested in supporting students. And they also help your editors because sometimes we get a paper that's very, very original that's in a field that your editors are like, we kind of understand what this is, but it's incredibly advanced. And the peer reviews can also help us and say, this is the thing this author needs to work on. This is what you need to understand and here's how to best support them. And that's really why peer review is really important. There's also the kind of, it's the crucible that takes a really good thing and makes it even better at the bottom. So that's that. Uh, those are the types of peer review what usurge uses now is uh, double anonymized. We're changing the uh, way we uh, say these things are, we're going through an EDI process where we're working on uh, equity, diversity, and inclusivity. And one of the things that we're learning is the, like there are different forms that one can basically express what usurge does. And to be more inclusive, those terms are going to be changed to anonymized. You don't lose anything by calling them anonymized, double anonymized. Basically, to tell you what the difference is, open is you and the peer reviewer know one another. You know who you are. You know your names. Uh, anonymized would be you don't know who the reviewer is, but they know who you are. Double anonymized, neither of you know who you are. Why does user use uh, double anonymized? Basically, it protects everyone. It makes sure that you're getting genuine input. And at the end of the day, it means that you're not going to be personally hurt. They're not going to be like holding a grudge against you. Say you criticize someone's work. Say you criticize. Dr. Wise work. Dr. Wise, work. well, I now know Shay has criticized my work. Next time Shay is in one of my class, or I'm going to tell one of my colleagues, Shay doesn't know what Shay's talking about. It's that sort of thing. It protects the students, it protects the reviewers. It's really just better for everyone. Double anonymized. Uh, this is an important thing. It comes up in this stage and also the copy editing stage. Uh, you, once the peer review comes in, your editors will look at it, they will see what is appropriate to send on to you. Because we get like specific feedback to us and specific feedback to the article itself, we then send it on to you. You receive the feedback as to like what should this person do to improve their work. What does this thing need to do? And they will give us advice as to whether this should be a accept it with revisions, accept it but send it through another round of peer review, that sort of thing. Those are the advice they will give to us. It's important you don't have to agree with everything. If a um, peer reviewer says. The need to change everything top to bottom. You can say, I'm not willing to change everything top to bottom. I think these things need to be changed. And then that's a choice you make. The editors then have to decide, does doing that make the paper different sufficiently enough that it can go to a different round of peer review? Or does it just need to sort of go to a different venue entirely? The request we make for you as editor or as authors is that when you receive the feedback, you are uh, diplomatic and polite. Most, we've only really ever had one person who wasn't polite, but they were very impolite and I felt bad for the editor and I still tell the story of that specific editor. Jordan knows what I'm talking about. Uh, and be grateful for the feedback, not necessarily in the moment because when you get criticism or feedback, there's a kind of an ego bruising aspect that just happens, but understand that all of the reviewers we've ever had, all of your editors are only interested in making your work stronger. They're not out there to make you feel bad. They're not out there to make you feel anything but the intelligent and hardworking person you are just improving it. So just keep that in mind when you receive the feedback and it's like, this should be changed. Even if you don't agree with it, why think about why the editors are saying this should be changed. What is it about that that is confusing to people or isn't clear? Think about that. Ultimately though, the decision is on your editors. So if you don't want to do the revisions, or you don't do the revisions to the sort of satisfaction of your editors, they can say, you either have to do this or we can't publish it because that's sort of the, that sort of final bar test. But we very rarely had anyone be like, no, I'm not gonna do it at that point. We have had someone say, this is like, I thought my paper was perfect. I don't, I don't care for anyone's feedback. Don't, don't be that person. Cause like the feedback is there to help you. And that's that. This, this is an example of I'm copy editing. This is uh, Gassan's copy editing. This is something that when you look at it is, I, I hope to you as it is to me immediately terrifying. It's a track changes thing of where everything that could possibly be highlighted 
for a change or an editor, it's not unclear or it could be improved, is highlighted by our former uh, graduate editor in chief. He's, he's an amazing person. He's still at the U of S. If you ever see him, you'll, you'll know him. He's very friendly. If he hasn't had coffee, don't approach him. Um, but basically, this is what you would receive one sort of sheet of this is what copy editing and peer feedback review looks like. This is where that note we had earlier of we don't have to agree with everything comes into play because you, if you tried to implement every single possible change, like there is, you could just accept all and then look at the more substantive stuff. That's fine too. But it's important that this makes sense to you and it's not just an automatic process. So this is something that it takes time. These are the peer review process and the copy editing process for the authors are the most uh, onerous and cumbersome work wise. But this is just an example of what that looks like. And I, I love looking at it. And that's, uh, we'll move on because I could stare and point all, all day. But yeah, the rest is fun. To me, the other parts are fun too. But copy editing is only cumbersome, really. I said it's it along with the peer review is the most cumbersome for authors in that that's the sort of stage where you've basically done everything you really need to do substantially to make the arguments clear, to make your uh, citations like on point to make sure that the research is speaking to the field. It's this is a more like your commas are out of place or this sentence isn't clear. This is in passive voice. This is an active. Your editors will go and look through all of that and then send it to you. And it's a really a really deep proofreading process. At that point, you for the grammar and the punctuation, it's probably in your best interest to accept those and look at like, OK, I use I don't use commas enough or I need to learn how the Oxford comma works way more thoroughly because this one editor has just said a bunch of things about the Oxford comma and it's getting on my nerves. That would be me. I'm the one who cares about the Oxford comma. <laughs> so when you get that back, you accept change however you want. Really important at that stage, you can say, I don't agree with this comma because in my head it reads like this and that's totally fine. When that is done, you send it back to us, production. You don't have to really do any work at production until you get emails from your editor at that point. You should have a lead editor at that point who you've sort of grown accustomed to, built a, mi a minor online friendship with, and it's nice and friendly. Uh, they will send you an email at a certain point when the layout people have sort of gotten your paper done. It's called a proof ready for publication. So it's, this is what it's going to look like when it's published. It's important that when the editor contacts you that you get back as soon as you can, because if we don't hear back within 48 hours, we figure that means it looks good to you. It's important because if there's a minor thing you wanna change or add or that you hadn't thought of, like I wanted to put a line of acknowledgement or actually I don't like the way that looks, I would like this the second column to be like shorter or like be a little block there. That's the time for that. If you don't say it, then you can get a paper that has all the things you wanna say, but might not look the way you want it to look. And only minor ones, you can't be like, actually give it back to me, I'm gonna go back to square one. So there's that. <laughs> okay, thanks, Brennan. I will go through how to prepare uh, a paper, research snapshot, artwork for submission to us. So first, I would request reviewing the requirements on our website. And I have the website listed below here. So it's usurge.journals.usask.ca. So you can review the requirements on our web website, review the publication agreement, which Brendan discussed at length. Um, and then you can contact us if you need any assistance or if you have any kind of preliminary questions. So we also have our um, email address here at the bottom. So it's usurge at usask.ca. So I'll go through a few tips here um, for preparing your submission. And first, remember that your audience and purpose has shifted. So most of the papers that we receive were written for um, a class at the university, an undergraduate course. Um, so the, I guess it was written for the purpose to fulfill um, uh, class assignment guidelines or objectives, um, and then written for to be read by your professor or your um, TA. So that kind of shifts when you are submitting to USERGE. Uh, your new purpose will be to share the results of your research, share your paper outside the walls of the classroom, and then your new audience will be anyone who's able to access your publication for free online. So keeping that in mind before you submit and as you're making kind of your preliminary edits and smoothing things out. So you want to think about the purpose, what the new purpose is after uh, you're getting sort of 
the paper beyond the walls of the classroom, who's your new audience, and then kind of addressing the higher order concerns. So looking at whether your paper has a logical flow to it, um, what's the main point or your thesis, and is it clear what that main point or thesis is, and what's the overall story that you're trying to tell within your submission. So tips for revising. Um, for instance, if you're submitting a research snapshot and you're saying, I used X framework to assess a public health pamphlet on vaccines for readability and clarity. Some questions that you might wanna ask yourself is, so what, why should people care? Why did you do it? What are the implications of your analysis? All of these questions may seem obvious to you as the author of the work, um, but you wanna make it explicit and obvious for the audience as well, especially for audience members who might not have the same level of previous knowledge that you do on the topic. So um, kind of another suggestion for helping to improve your writing skills and smooth out that submission before before you submit to us is um, the next time you read something or come across something that's really clearly written and, and you feel that it makes sense what you're reading, even if you don't have a lot of previous knowledge on the topic, um, just ask yourself why it's clear. How did the writer present the information? How did they define their terms? Um, did they explain with examples? Were the examples helpful? Were they able to provide context that you may have been lacking had they not provided the context? And did they use plain language to help get their point across? So some, some points to think about before you submit your work. Um, copyright, Brennan kind of covered the copyright within his section. Um, conflicts of interest. So obviously if you're, if Brennan is the heir to a big fortune and Brennan's dad uh, submits a submits a paper to the social sciences, that's obviously a conflict of interest. So we would just ask that you disclose that conflict of interest and we'll find an editor other than Brennan to kind of look after the paper in that scenario. Uh, make sure you screen your paper thoroughly for plagiarism. So plagiarism is not always intentional. So spot check your paraphrasing, um, notice uh, style shifts, and, and just make sure that you've cited everything properly before you submit to us. Privacy, so if you have, um, if you're doing research with human subjects, just making sure that there's no identifying information within your submission. Also removing any of your own identifying information or of your uh, co-authors. And that way we can really make sure to preserve the integrity of the peer review process, especially the double anonymized peer review process that we use. Uh, make sure if you're using animal or human uh, subjects or participants, especially that you have ethics approval beforehand. Um, and then screen your paper for language bias. So there is a great workshop through the student learning services on uh, bias in language. Uh, I'll, I'll send some info on that to Brooke as well, and she can send that to you guys um, in addition to the slides after the presentation here. And then asking yourself whether you had any co-authors. So if there's anybody that uh, contributed to your work quite substantially, you're gonna want to ask their permission first for whether it's okay with them to publish the work. And then also you're going to want to list them as a co-author. So the Hawks and the Locks is the editing framework that we tend to follow. So Hawks stands for higher order concerns and LOCK stands for lower order concerns. So before you submit, I would suggest kind of taking a look at this higher order concerns column and just making your way through them and checking them off as you go. So uh, we've covered most of them already through the previous slides, but looking at what's my audience going to be if I'm submitting to an open access journal, what's the purpose of my paper and why am I wanting to publish it within an open access journal, looking at things like the logical flow, organization, um, argumentation, thesis, rationale. So the sort of overarching structure and content of your paper. So the locks are the little things like spelling, grammar, et cetera. And that's really not a big deal before. Um, so as you're submitting, those little issues are not a big deal because the editors will work through during the copy editing stage and catch all of those, those little issues and, and make it nice and smooth for uh, 
the publication. So resources. Um, if you'd like some more hands-on help before you submit your paper or more hands-on help uh, just with writing papers in general, I would suggest contacting the Writing Help Center here at the university. So it's free. Um, you can, I've got a link there. You can check out the Writing Center website and you can also email the Writing Center coordinator, Leave Markin. She's super lovely and helpful. Um, if you have any questions, she's more than happy to answer them. And she can also match you with a discipline appropriate writing tutor. So that would be free hands-on writing help for you with, uh, yeah, that you can access before you submit to usurge. And I'll pass the mic back over to Brennan. This is where the floor is open for any questions. And, and if I don't know the answer, you can be sure Jordan will know the answer. So. And first off, thank you, Jordan and Brennan, because that was really great. And I, you know, even as someone who has looked at the user's website many times, still learned a lot of stuff. So thank you. And yes, if anyone has questions, you can either unmute yourself or throw them in the chat and I can read them out too if people are more comfortable that way. I actually.